Well, good morning, church. It's good to see you this morning, and welcome to anyone online. I want to just shout out to, I think my nieces are watching, so hi, guys. They're like three years old, so. Um, Well, good morning. If we haven't met before, my name is Luke. I am one of the ministry staff here, and I think I have like the longest title. Um, I'm the Minister of Contemporary Worship in Senior High Youth. And if you come to the service, normally you probably see me leading the music. And so I want to just say thank you, Greg, and the rest of the team for leading us in worship this morning. It was so great to hear you guys singing um, from your perspective. Um, I love hearing that. But today I get the privilege and the honor of closing out our series that we've been in, in the book of Acts, uh, entitled Unexpected, God is on the Move. And we've been able to see how God has been on the move in the story of Acts in the early church. And hopefully you've been able to reflect in your own life how God has been on the move. Um, But today we've got a great passage that I believe if you are a, if you know someone who is a skeptic of Christianity, if you know someone who is maybe uh, far from God, or if you yourself are maybe a skeptic, you're not sure what you believe about this God, I believe this message is for you. And so let us pray before we begin. Lord, we thank you that your word is eternal. Thank you that these words that were spoken 2,000 years ago to the early church had the same power to speak to us today in 2024. So God, we ask and pray that you would illuminate this word and open our hearts, open our minds for what you have to say to us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think it's no secret that we live in a post-Christian society. Church attendance is declining and continues to decline. Less and less people are attending church here in America, here in the West in general. According to one research study, church attendance has declined about 12% over the last decade. And uh, meanwhile, the rise of the nuns has increased significantly. And these are not Catholic nuns. These are a group that we call the religious nuns. They don't have any religious affiliation or they're atheists. Um, That group is on the rise. And only one in three millennials, I mean my generation, only one in three actually attend church more than once a month. And the sad reality about this, it's not just about declining church attendance, but it's about the decline of a biblical worldview. You might ask, like, what is a worldview? Everyone has a worldview. It's a way in which you view the world. So let me give you an example. Here on the North Shore, a worldview might be uh, my kids are going to grow up and they're going to go to school, they're going to go to college, and then get a job, and then move to the city, and then meet someone, get married, then move back to the suburbs, start a family, and the cycle continues. Now, that might describe a lot of your lives, and there's nothing right or wrong with that. But that, that's a worldview, something that we assume is true about life, <laughs> that this is the way world, the world works. It helps us make sense of our world. And so a biblical worldview is when you let the story of Scripture and the Bible dictate how you live your life. And so less and less are people approaching life with a biblical worldview. There's one study that says that since the pandemic, four years ago, the number of adults in America who have a biblical worldview has dropped 33%. This next generation is the most biblically illiterate generation that has ever faced America. It's why I've devoted really my life the last decade to reaching this next generation with the gospel. Because people don't know the Bible. We've got to reach them. So why does this matter? You might, for you, you might have a family member or a friend who wants nothing to do with the church. Or maybe they're skeptical of Christianity. The truth is they have a worldview. And they have a worldview that they've bought into for whatever reason that's keeping them from hearing the gospel. And so if the church is to survive, we need to continue to rethink how are we to engage our culture with the gospel, with this good news. And as we'll see in this passage, Paul, he uh, encountered some of the same challenges that we are facing today as a culture. And so we're going to almost look at this passage as like a case study for How did Paul approach the people of his day and how did he share the good news with them and what can we learn to how we can apply it to our own context today? So if you would like to follow along, we're going to be in 
Acts 17, starting in verse 16. I think there's a Bible probably in the pew in front of you if you want to grab that. Um, but just to catch us up for where we've been. We've been in the story of Acts. Last week, Spencer preached on Paul and Silas in prison in Philippi. And God did a miracle and opened the prison doors and they escaped and they converted the jailer. They preached the gospel to the jailer. His whole household came to Christ. And then they moved to Thessalonica, which is another city, and they preached the gospel there. They would go into the synagogues, preach the message, and some of them, some people believed, but there were some Jews who uh, were jealous of them because people were basically deconverting from Judaism. And so they were jealous and decided to start a mob. And so they started a riot, started rioting in the streets, and they wanted to go after Paul and Silas to stop them from preaching because they were preaching about this King Jesus, not King Caesar in their day. And so Paul and his crew, they said, we got we to gotta get out of here. So they left Thessalonica. They went to another city nearby in Berea, just west. And when they got there, they did the same thing. They preached again in the synagogues. And this time, people were a little bit more receptive to the gospel. But that same group, that mob that started in Thessalonica, heard about them preaching in Berea. And so they're like, we got to stop them. So they started coming after them in Berea. And Paul and Silas and his crew were like, we got we to get out of here. Um, they decided to just send Paul down to Athens. He probably had some people with him, but the other leaders, Timothy and Silas, they decided to stay in Berea. And then they were going to meet with Paul uh, later. And so we get to this passage and it says in verse 16, Paul, he arrives in Athens and it says that while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. You can imagine Paul walking around the city of Athens. Has anyone ever been to Athens before? I've never been, but I, it's still beautiful to this day. But he sees even in his day, it was, once, it was this great uh, center of philosophy and culture. It was the place where Socrates and Aristotle and Plato, some of the great philosophers, lived and taught. And he sees all these images and these sculptures and buildings. And he doesn't just notice that they're these beautiful works of art, but he notices what they represent and that they represent temples and pagan gods, the gods that this city worshipped. It says that he was deeply distressed to see these idols. And the wording here, it's literally that he was, he was provoked in his spirit. Like it irritated him. Like this bothered him to see these idols. Have you ever had that feeling of seeing something that bothers you? Like this is probably unique to me, but in my role here, when I see like old church sound equipment that no one's been using for years and needs to be thrown away, that bothers me. <laughs> Maybe for you, it's you're a parent. You come home and your kids have just decimated your house and they haven't done what you've asked them to. They haven't cleaned. It just bothers you. That's the feeling that Paul has when he sees these idols. It just bothers him. And why? It's because he sees how far from God these people are. He sees that this is a city that needs the gospel. And so if we're going to learn something from Paul about how we're going to engage our contemporary culture with the gospel, we need to be paying attention to what are the idols in our own town. What are the idols here in Northbrook? What are the idols here on the North Shore? Remember, idols are basically anything that we give our devotion to over and above God. They're basically the things that become our gods. And so what are the idols in our culture? Is it money? Is it money? <laughs> Is it financial security? Is it career success? Is it going on the fanciest vacations? Is it trying to gain a certain social status? Is it comfort? I think it's all those things. And I'll be honest with you for a moment. I have a little confession to make. Because as a church leader here in Northbrook, I see all the idols <laughs> that our culture faces. And that our culture clings to. And it, and it frustrates me sometimes. I mean, similar to Paul, it bothers me. But unlike Paul, I can become a little bit cynical and a little bit annoyed and just think, like, this pe these people don't get it. 
Like our culture just doesn't get it. <laughs> like why, why don't people come to church more? Like this culture is just never going to change. <laughs> Maybe you think that way about friends and family in your own life who don't know Christ. You think they can never change. But here's the thing. Instead of becoming cynical or annoyed, we should really think these people need the gospel. Like these people are lost. And that's how Paul saw the city of Athens. So Paul, he didn't just sit there, wallow in his distress, but he took action. It says that he began to have discussions with people. He began talking to the people there in the synagogues, as was his custom. It says he was also in the marketplace every day, speaking with those who happened to be there. I mean, Paul did not take a day off. He was not here just to tour Athens. He was there to minister the gospel. And he was talking to people uh, in the marketplace. It was the common place where people gathered. I mean, it'd be the equivalent today of, I don't know, the Village Green maybe, or the, uh, uh, the park you walk to every day, or maybe it's your workplace, um, maybe it's your cafeteria at school. Um, the common places where people gathered, Paul was there. And so we, just like Paul, we must go to where people are and engage in conversations with them. We've got we've to talk to people, <laughs> learn about their culture, what motivates them, you know, what are, they, what are they passionate about? And the text says that there were also this, these two groups of people that were also listening to what Paul was saying. These Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were debating with him. Now let me give you a, a brief lesson on the Stoics and the Epicureans. I'll start with the Stoics. So the Stoics they were this group that believed in this atomic theory that basically life is just a random collection of atoms. Like there's no really meaning to life. There's no need for a God. If there is one, he's not really involved. These were basically your atheists. And then on the other hand, we had the Stoics who were what we call pantheists. They believed that God was like this force that was in everything. Like God is in the wood. He's in this book. He's in my shirt. He's in the ceiling. God is in everything. And the Epicureans, their, their main goal in life was basically to be happy and to avoid pain. Whereas the Stoics, their, their main goal in life was that if you can just endure whatever, they knew like you can't avoid pain. Like life is going to be painful. You're going to experience things. But if you can just endure whatever life throws at you and just be indifferent to it, not let your emotions take control, then you will find true freedom. And that's where we get the word stoic to describe someone who doesn't show much emotion. Some of you are stoic worshipers. I see it on your faces every Sunday. <laughs> Just kidding. But those were the two groups of people. And it might sound familiar <laughs> to what our culture believes today. Just want to be happy. Just want to avoid pain. Or, you know, something bad happens to your life. You just got to get through it. Those, are the, those were the philosophies that they, were, that they believed. And so they hear, these guys, they hear Paul debating, and some say, what does this babbler want to say? He seems to be proclaiming foreign divinities. That's because he was telling them about Jesus and the resurrection. This, that would have been unheard of for them. And so they were like, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? We want to know what it means. So Paul's like, okay, I'll tell you. And I love Luke's comment in verse 21. He says, Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. What does this sound like to you? Your average political news station just telling about what is the new thing of the day. Or maybe it's the podcast you listen to. You know, people just talking about, all right, what's the new thing? <laughs> that was what they loved to do. Like, and we do that today. We love to hear, you know, what's the newest thing? Sometimes we just like to debate whatever you know, <laughs> philosophy is going on. We don't actually do anything with it. We just talk. But that's, that's what was happening. That's a funny comment that he makes. But Paul, he has this opportunity to share the gospel with this group. He has a hearing, so he takes this opportunity. And so Paul, he begins his speech with the Athene with the, uh, in the Areopagus, and he says, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. 
What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. That was Paul's intro to share the gospel. He noticed that there were these idols and that they actually were quite religious. Notice that he didn't just say, you know, you guys are a bunch of pagans, you got to repent. He made a comment about what they believe and he saw, you guys actually, you, you've, you are very religious. But I noticed you've got this unknown God. And I'm here, I'm going to explain this to you. Tell you. Let me tell you about this God that you do not know. And so he says, the God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. You see, both the, Epics, uh, both the Epicureans and the Stoics, they thought they, could, they thought they could form God into an image and place them in temples, and then all they needed to do was just serve these gods and, make, and keep them happy. And we do this very same thing in our own life today. We think we can just form God into whatever image we think he is, and as long as we live according to that image of God that we have created, then we're good. And Paul says, no. <laughs> Like, God is bigger than that. That there is a God who made the world and everything in it. He's Lord of heaven and earth. And he does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as if he needed anything. God doesn't need anything. God doesn't need you. He he gives to everyone life and breath and all things. You don't get to decide what God is like. God gave you your life body. He gave you the breath in your lungs. He gave you the mind that you can even conceive of who he is. So Paul continues, from one ancestor, he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him. See, God created us to search for him. He created us to search for him. All of us are searching for God. And here's the thing, what I want you to know, every search for meaning in life is a search for God. Every search for meaning in life is a search for God. And God created us this way, Paul says, so that we would search for him and perhaps grope for him and find him. The word grope, it's it's an interesting word. It literally means to, to reach out or to feel around for something. The other week I was driving through McDonald's to pick up some food. And uh, on my way home, I was, you know, reaching into the bag and eating the fries while I was driving. Anyone else do this? Um, And I did what you would never want to do. I I dropped a fry in between the seats. And I just cleaned my car. I was like, no. And so the whole ride home, I was like reaching underneath the seat, feeling around for where the fry is while driving. I wouldn't recommend this, but... I was trying to find, I knew it was there, but I just couldn't grab it. And that's, that's what we're doing in our search for God. Like we're, we're, we're reaching around for him. We're trying to find him in the places. That's why we are captivated by new experiences. That's why we pursue the things that we do in life. That's why we, some of us, you love to like go travel and experience God in nature. Do you think you're closer to him there? I mean, here's the thing. All those things, they're all pointing to God. And Paul says he's, he's not that far. He's not that far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Paul's, he's quoting their own poets that they would have been familiar with. If you notice, he doesn't actually quote any scripture, any Hebrew scripture, because they wouldn't have been familiar with it. He's using what they already know to s- explain the gospel to them, to explain what God is like. And he says, since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Why? Because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. There is a day coming in which every one of us will stand before God and be judged. We don't know when this day is, but we know that it's going to happen. And so you cannot delay this decision. Notice that Paul doesn't even, he doesn't even mention the name of Jesus, but it's implied. Jesus is this man. 
And Jesus' resurrection is proof that this day is coming. So there's no excuse. You've got to put your faith in Jesus Christ. So what was the Athenians' response? In verse 32, it says that when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed, but others said, we'll hear you again about this. The resurrection of the dead, it would have been an unheard of concept and for the Stoics and the Epicureans and still the resurrection today can be the main barrier for people believing because how can a dead person come to life? But that's going to be a normal response when people hear the gospel. Some will scoff, but others will actually believe. (laughs) And we do see that some did become believers. Dionysius, who was a member of the Areopagite Council, and even a woman named Damaris who, was, who became a believer. And she was probably like a bystander at this meeting. It was probably mostly men just debating and she was listening. You never know who might believe. So what are you to do with all this? How can you begin to engage the culture of your day, the culture around you, the people in your life to share Christ with them? I want to give you some practical steps that you can even begin to take this week. You ready for them? You can even write them down if you want. Step one is to pray for compassion for the lost. Pray for your own heart. I mean, ask the Lord to give you a heart of compassion for the people in your life who don't know Jesus. Pray that you would begin to actually see Jesus as as he sees them, as, as people who are lost, who need the love of God. The step two is to pray for the lost. Like, actually pray for the lost people in your life that the Lord may bring to mind to you. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's just people that you commonly cross paths with, but pray for them and pray for their salvation that they would come to know Christ. And notice that in these first two steps, I'm not even challenging you to talk to anyone (laughs) except God because you need to have this conversation with God first before you can have it with others. So step three is engage in a spiritual conversation with someone. And how do you do this? You begin by asking them questions. Ask them questions about their life. What are they into? <laughs> what drives them? What's, what are they passionate about? And then you can begin to surface, you know, what are their motivations for living? What, what do they think the purpose of life is? And you can begin to ask them, like, what do you believe? Like, have you ever been to church? Do you want to come to my church? Obviously, it's It's got to be genuine. If you take a genuine interest in people's lives, God will open the door for spiritual conversations. And so here's why, here's why this matters. I, I mean, look, I'm, I'm 31 years old. All right, I grew up here in this town in Northwick. I grew up in church. I've had my own periods of rebellion, of walking away from God, of questioning my faith, but time and time again, it's been people in my life who have pursued me and asked me questions about my own life who have shared the gospel with me, whether it's been church leaders or family members or youth leaders who have not given up asking me questions and pursuing me. I wouldn't be where I am today if it weren't for, for people like that. And I'm not saying I've lived a lot of life Um, but I've lived enough life to experience a lot of things that life has to offer. I've searched for God in all different places, whether it be pleasure or success or popularity, you name it. And I still have yet to this day have found anything that has given me meaning or purpose in life other than a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's my reason for living. And I want that for you. And I want you to want that for others, too. It's the greatest news. So listen, as we close, if you would say that you have not yet made a decision to follow Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. That's that's step zero. (laughs) Because you can't really apply the other steps if you haven't start if you don't start there. You don't have to have all the answers. You just have to have faith. And so I'll lead you in a simple prayer. And we're actually gonna uh, we're going to be taking communion in a, here in a moment. And it's, it's, you can make a tangible response <laughs> to the gospel by receiving the body and blood of Christ. So let us pray. And if you need to come to Christ, pray this with me. Lord, I surrender my life to you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins, 
for resurrecting me to new life. Thank you that you have resurrected to new life so that I can have new life in you. And I recognize that you are the God of heaven and earth, the giver of breath and life and all things. And so I put my faith in you. And Lord, I pray for all of us that we would have hearts, that you would give us hearts of compassion for the lost people in our lives who don't know you. God, would you open the doors to conversations for us to have about you? Give us the courage and the boldness and the winsomeness that Paul had who became all things to all people so that some might be saved. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.